Um, so this talk is kind of catered more to your to you guys, to a wide audience. So we're going to talk about um, the experiments and the historical progression that's brought us up to where we are now, and we're going to talk about like the exciting near future. Um, so yeah. So this guy, Randy Mills, I first discovered him 15 years ago. I was 17. Um, I started asking professors uh, what was going on with this guy and uh, his crazy ideas. You can see here that uh, I think this was IEE Spectrum Magazine rated Randall Mills a loser. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, this thing is that's, that's the contraption that the, the ghosts get sucked into, I think, right? Um, Blacklight Power says it's developing a revolutionary energy source and it won't let the laws of physics stand in its way. In 1964, there was a professor named George Gurka. He's still around, still alive. Um, and he came to understand, he was, he was building on the work of Schott and others, and he came to discover that only continuous membranes of charge can undergo acceleration without radiating energy. Point charges can't, but continuous membranes can, whether they're spheres, planes, infinite cylinders, infinite solenoids, you know, any, any, any situation you pick, only if the charges are you know, packed densely enough to form a continuous surface, uh, is it possible in nature for accelerating charges to, to be stable? Randall Mills built on this idea in the late 1980s. Um, he actually, his pr he had a professor at MIT named Herman House who had done some work along these lines too. Um, I actually call this general criterion of non-radiation to be the Goodica House condition because Goodica derived it in 1964. House derived it again in like 1986. So Mills was building on this idea and he said, well, okay, let's go back to the Bohr model, the, the, the electron orbiting the proton. So let's, let's, let's sweep it out until it forms a loop. Let's take that loop and sweep it out until it becomes a sphere. And suddenly you have this very strange object. You have a spherical shell of charge completely surrounding the nucleus. Um, so the whole atom is neutral because the proton is positively charged and the shell is negatively charged. And outside that shell, it's, you don't see any charge. It's neutral. Um, but every po it's not a monolithic sphere because every point on that sphere is, is, is traveling along a different trajectory. There's all these, these rings of, of, of flowing current on the surface of the sphere um, that allow the whole sphere to be in force balance and allow it to, to have angular momentum. And so this model, it was, it was a very original. It's the first time anybody had proposed something like this. Um, and he called it the orbit sphere. And it was a breakthrough. It was a serious breakthrough because for the first time in history, we have a feasible solution to the stability of the electron in the atom and a basis for understanding all of, m all of matter, um, atoms and molecules and so forth, um, using only classical physical laws, by which I mean Maxwell's equations, which govern the laws of electricity and magnetism, and Newton's laws, which govern, you know, govern mechanics, and special relativity, which is also kind of a, an extension of electro, you know, electromagnetic theory. So this is a big deal. And it became the basis for an entire new theory of nature in which um, he was able to solve the structures of, of, of larger atoms uh, with multiple electron shells. He extended it to the first 20 atoms of the periodic table shown here. Um, his data sets were able to match experimental values for the energy it takes to rip electrons off of every atom and every ion. Um, and you, know, you can basically take this calcium atom and rip 20 electrons off of it and you can predict the energies of every single, um, energy, every single ionization energy to an incredibly precise degree. It's like five significant figure accuracy, which is um, about, it's within the range of experimental uncertainty. All of that is, amounts to a pretty incredible amount of theoretical progress by one man over the course of 15 years. I want to talk about one very small, almost insignificant uh, result of this new theory of the atom. And it's that the hydrogen atom may potentially have a series of orbits that fall below what is traditionally considered to be the ground state orbit. So every, <coughs> every atom will the electrons around every atom will be able to absorb and emit light. They'll be able to absorb a, f a photon of energy and jump to a new orbit, a larger orbit, and then that orbit is unstable, so they fall back down to the ground state. And we see these 
these jumps, these excited state jumps, form the spectrum, the visible, you know, the spectrum that we see from from atoms and molecules. Well, it was always uh, unexplainable or in inexplicable why the electron would hit the ground state and stop. But now Randy had, you know, Randall Mills had a successful theory for why that was. Um, he understood the stability of the atom and the physics that were happening, and he said, well, under certain conditions, I think you can go below the ground state to this one-half state, one-third, one-fourth, one-fifth, one-sixth, one-seventh, one-eighth, one-ninth. There's a lot more dots here until you get to one over 137. And when you get to that state, 137th the size of an ordinary hydrogen atom, the currents of the electron are actually traveling so fast that they're approaching speed of light, so you can't really go any further below that. So that's the ground state. <laughs> The ground state is, is now the, the, the state in which the physics doesn't allow the electron to get any smaller. What you're seeing here is really interesting. It's two oscillators, maybe this big, about this far apart. Um, and what, what's happening in this picture is energy is flowing, power is flowing from one to the other, from one oscillator as an emitter, one oscillator as a receiver, without the exchange of light, without the emission or absorption of photons. And this is something that's being developed at MIT for um, wireless charging devices. It's still kind of experimental. I haven't seen them come out with anything with it lately, or yet, rather. But I, theoretically, you'll, you should be able to charge your cell phone from up to six or seven or eight feet away from the source, the charging station. And it's really cool. And the, what makes it work is that it's not like a, an antenna. It's not just broadcasting energy out into space in all directions. It's oscillating a certain frequency, which couples the multipole fields of one oscillator will couple with the other, and the power will flow from one device to the other device without the loss of energy to space. So this is a how this is a, on you know this is seen on a macroscopic scale. This is actually comes out of a patent from MIT. Um, but many years before this happened, you know, Randy, <coughs> sorry, he, Dr. Mills, <laughs> Randall Mills. Um, he theorized that something like this could happen between two atoms on a microscopic scale. Um, in, this, in this illustration here, what you see is you see a hydrogen atom, you bump it up to a lithium atom. Now, the lithium atom um, can ionize electrons, and if it ionizes two electrons, it, the amount of energy it takes to ionize two electrons is, in mul is like a multiple of 27.2 electron volts, which is like a magic number that allows the hydrogen atom to shrink. To like a to a hydrino state to like a one third hydrino in this case, and so the mechanism is really they're both electromagnetic objects and energy is being is coupling from from the from the um, hydrogen atom which is the emitter to the lithium atom which is the receiver and it's able to absorb that energy because it's able to shed the energy immediately by breaking off electrons. The lithium atom is unchanged in the reaction because it can recapture its electrons and it's it's just a lithium atom, but the hydrogen atom undergoes this this chemical state change to become a hydrino atom. <coughs> and this is really cool because the electron and the proton attract, right? So as you bring them closer together, you're actually releasing energy from the system. And it's more energy than you get from, say, the, the breakage of bonds in a chemical reaction. It's not as much energy as you'd get from nuclear power um, because it's just a chemical change in the hydrogen atom. But it's still pretty phenomenally large. It's, you know, getting to like a one-fourth hydrino is like 200 times uh, more energy than, than combusting hydrogen and oxygen to make water. So it's a lot of energy. And he realized very quickly that this would become, this is the scientific basis for a new power source.